Good afternoon, everyone. So we are live on Zoom. We are live on Facebook. I just want to say a big welcome and uh, thank you to all our panelists, our esteemed panelists, for joining us here today. We have a huge event ahead of us. My name is Bianca Mujeni, and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is one of the organizations that's presenting uh, this evening tonight. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that many of us are gathered here today on Indigenous land. Um, I am speaking to you personally from Montreal, uh, Jojage, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganeangehaga people, and it's a place that's long been uh, a point of meeting and exchange among many First Nations. So I just want to honor the, the Ganeangehaga people as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm here on. I also want to thank our co-organizers, Just Peace Advocates, the Canadian Council for Justice and Peace, uh, and the Civic Coalition for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem. This event simply couldn't have happened without these groups. I also want to extend a huge appreciation to the more than 50 groups. Um, this is a huge portion of civil society that are supporting this event tonight, um, as well as our media sponsors. And for a full list um, of the supporting organizations, um, please check out the, uh, the chat um, and, uh, and, and, and more information at Just Peace Advocates uh, website. Um, it's amazing to see such a great turnout this evening, as, this e well, evening in, in Palestine, afternoon uh, in Montreal, Toronto. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're live streaming to Facebook as well. So if you have any friends um, that did not manage to get in through the registration process, you can let them know that they can watch uh, this event live at facebook.com slash justpeaceadvocatescanada. Um, and the link for that is also in the chat. So tonight we are going to be hearing from Zakaria O'Day, who's the executive director of the Civic Coalition for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem. We'll be hearing from Jonathan Kutab, international human rights lawyer, um, as well, and he's also the founder of Al-Haq. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Yusuf Al-Nachi, who's the director of the Department of Tourism and Archaeology at uh, Al-Haram Al-Sharif in Jerusalem, as well as Aziza Kanji, who's a legal academic and journalist. Um, so our discussion this evening is about the evictions, home demolitions that we're seeing in Al-Quds, Jerusalem, the demographic changes that we're seeing, and the, the threats to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, and, and really the significance uh, of all of this, as well as Canada's role in this. Many of the organizers are, are based in Canada and the actions that can be taken by the international community. And, you know, we, we really do want this event to be as, as, as participatory as possible. And there really are so many actions that you can take today. So for instance, today's event is also a fundraiser. Um, so please consider donating to the Civic Coalition um, for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem, CCPRJ, which provides legal support in defense of the rights of people in Jerusalem. This is very critical at this time, given the evictions and the home demolitions that we're seeing. Donations can be made uh, through Just Peace, Just Peace Advocates. You can see the link is in the chat again, and we'll also be posting that in, uh, on Facebook. Um, the Civic Coalition for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem is an NGO that contributes to very effective mobilization and the cooperation of civil society vis-a-vis -vis Israeli policies that have been undermining Palestinian rights, identity, and presence uh, in occupied East Jerusalem. They're doing really incredible, critical work, and they need your support. So you'll be hearing more details about that later in the evening. And there are a number of different ways that, that you can donate. So details, again, in the chat. Um, there's also a parliamentary uh, petition for anyone who's living in Canada who can sign on to that. It was just approved by Liberal MP uh, Nathan Erskine-Smith. Um, and among other demands, it's calling on the Canadian government to call on Israel to stop its evictions of the Palestinian families um, and to take steps that are required to stop Israel's violations of international law. Um, so this, can be, uh, this action can be taken by anyone living in Canada. There is also an action alert that can be taken um, both by people living in Canada and internationally. Um, and this action alert is actually quite an incredible tool that allows you to write to all 
Canadian MPs, as well as Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, calling on them to condemn the evictions of Palestinian families in East Jerusalem and to demand an end to Israel's violation of international law. So just a little bit of a housekeeping as we move forward. The chat is now open. Um, people at home, we're looking very forward to hearing from you. We love exchange of ideas. Um, and to hear from you, we just have a very, very basic request that you keep your comments civil. Um, please, no racist, sexist, or otherwise hateful commentary. This is not welcome. And, uh, and if you engage in, in this type of activity, we will have to remove you uh, from, from the chat and from the event. So thank you for that. Um, so again, my name is Bianca Majeni. I'm here representing the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Um, and our role is to challenge unjust foreign policy measures um, and we aim to bridge the gap between the perception and reality of Canada's role in the world. You can find out more about the work that we do at foreignpolicy.ca. So alongside Just Peace Advocates and, uh, and others, um, we ran a campaign urging UN member states to vote no to Canada's bid for United Nations Security Council seat in the spring. And among other issues, Palestine was a major focus of the campaign. And we cited Canada's consistent anti-Palestinian positions. Now Canada lost its bid and this loss should be understood as a small victory for Palestinian rights. Um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is participating in this event because there's a long history of Canada contributing to Palestinian dispossession. During World War I, 400 Canadians fought to help the British conquer Palestine. Canadian Supreme Court Justice is considered a lead architect of the anti-Palestinian partition plan which gave the Zionist movement 55% of historic Palestine, despite owning uh, less than 7% of the land and making up a third of the population. Hundreds of Canadians fought to de-Arabize Palestine in 1947 and 48. When Israel proclaimed Jerusalem its capital in December of 1949, Canada voted against an Australian resolution at the General Assembly calling for Jerusalem to be put under international control. And that, that passed 38 to 14 after Israel captured East Jerusalem in the 1967 war, uh, the Security Council called on Israel to drop its plan to annex Jerusalem. The vote was unanimous with the exception of Ottawa and Washington's abstentions. Now this week, um, coming back to the present, the Trudeau government voted against half a dozen widely supported UN General Assembly resolutions upholding Palestinian rights, including one titled peaceful settlement of question of Palestine that passed 145 in favor and seven against. The resolution reaffirmed the illegality of Israeli settlement activities and all other unilateral measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the city of Jerusalem. So today we'll be hearing from our esteemed panelists on the threat to Al-Quds Jerusalem. It's a very, very timely panel. We'll then be taking questions from some media and then from the audience. So please use the Q&A um, and the chat to ask your questions um, because hopefully we'll have time towards the end uh, to read out uh, and ask um, the panelists uh, some of these questions. Uh, it also gives me great pleasure right now to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Zafar Bangash, who's the director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought. He'll be kicking us off by sharing the context around the threat to Al-Quds Jerusalem and its significance, as well as ways that we can engage and support. So I'm going to hand it over to Zafar. Welcome, Zafar. Thank you very much, Bianca. And before I start, I would like to extend my greetings of salam, which means peace to all of our panelists, as well as uh, all the other participants around the world. Uh, as uh, Bianca, you mentioned, uh, today we have a very, very distinguished uh, group of panelists that are going to take us through this situation in Al-Quds, which is the Arabic word for Jerusalem. And of course, uh, Al-Quds um, consists or houses the Haram al-Sharif, which is a very, very uh, sacred place for uh, the Muslims worldwide. Uh, the Haram al-Sharif, of course, uh, houses, this is the walled compound that houses the Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, which is the first Qibla of the Muslims, as well as the Dome of the Rock, which you see on my right-hand side, uh, as well as uh, many zawiyas and madrasas, etc. It is extremely sacred uh, territory for Muslims worldwide. 
in the noble quran um it is mentioned that uh, the noble prophet was taken on a nightly journey from masjid al haram in makkah to masjid al aqsa in al quds jerusalem and from there of course he went on his heavenly journey which is referred to as al miraj now this was a living miracle of the prophet of islam and of course this entire uh, area the haram al sharif is deeply embedded in the psyche of the muslims as well as it is a part of a shared memory of the muslims and so its defense and preservation is not only the responsibility of the palestinian people but in fact of the entire muslim umma and i'm sure our panelists would be touching on this our first panelist of course is uh, zakaria ode who is the director of the civic coalition for palestinian rights in jerusalem he has been a civil society grassroots activist as well as human rights defender his entire adult life he is an expert on the human rights and legal situation in occupied palestine he also serves as chair of the board of trustees of the defense for children international palestine which is based in ramallah now zakaria is going to focus on the forced demographic changes that are taking place the eviction of palestinians home demolitions and settlers moving in and whatever the situation on the ground is and of course uh, the work of civic coalition and the need for funds uh, in order to defend the people the palestinians that are being forced uh, from their homes in jerusalem so over to you zakaria first of all i would like to thank all the organization who really participating in making this success event i would like to thank a uh, just peace advocate and the canadian council for justice and peace and the canadian foreign policy institute for all the work they did in order to prepare for this event which give us uh, the opportunity to talk to you to communicate with you and uh, we hope that this will be a useful Uh, event or time that we by raising the issue related to Jerusalem in fact why i mean why we talk about Jerusalem in fact uh, because sometimes people talk about Jerusalem sometimes west bank sometimes gaza in fact we are talking about Jerusalem because Jerusalem is one of the best example about the israeli colonial settler apartheid regime that has been going on for over then 72 years not only 35 53 years of israeli occupation but since the nakba since 1948 and jerusalem because jerusalem has been going through a unique special situation where has it has been always one of the focus of the israeli by a government's violation against our people against the palestinian people in fact i would like to start to talk about that with this situation of covid-19 which has been really affecting uh, globally most countries or all countries including the palestine and the palestinian people you know palestinians have been really affecting affected and suffering of the covid because this has been affecting the social economic and life of the palestinians you know even even it's an example for the discrimination because you know we had as a organization to struggle to push the israeli ministry of health to open corona test stations in east jerusalem and we had to go to the general attorney the israeli general attorney in order to force the ministry to open a corona test center in is occupied is jerusalem and then we had as well to go to bush as again to open a test station or centers in the palestinian neighborhoods behind the wall or outside the wall but part of jerusalem you know during the corona the israeli police and the israeli government have been preventing any palestinian local initiative by the people in the neighborhood like to provide health 
services or material to provide food uh, packages or food supply. So they have been uh, they have been arresting the the committees in the neighborhood. They have been arresting the the activists who are trying to provide support for our people even during the corona, even during this crisis that all of us, we have been, we have been uh, going uh, through. Not only that, but even during the corona, during 2020, the Palestinians, the Palestinian occupied territories in general and uh, East Jerusalem in particular has been witnessing an escalation and a big increase of the Israeli violations even more than the previous years. So we have been witnessing too many Israeli plans uh, for expanding uh, 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 settlements, uh, too many, too many violations, uh, too many home demolitions, even more than the year 2019. We used to know or we used to consider 2019 is the highest, but even this year during the corona, it has been higher. Of course, all this escalation has been really affected by the Trump administration policy, as our colleague mentioned. You know, we know since Trump came to power, he took some policies, some he took some action. Uh, part of it, he declared that Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel. He moved the American embassy from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem. Uh, as well, he closed the consulate in East in Jerusalem, which is used to be as for the East Jerusalem. As well, he stopped funding UNRWA. UNRWA is the United Nations Relief Agency, which provides support for the Palestinian refugees. And as well, uh, uh, he stopped funding the Palestinian hospitals in occupied East Jerusalem. So all this action and all this policy by the Trump administration, it encouraged the Israelis, it, it gave them more green line to go on and to continue with their violations, to continue with their annexation policy. You know, one of the problems that Jerusalem is facing because since 19 and makes it it's different than the rest of the occupied territories, that Jerusalem, soon after its occupation in 1967, it was annexed by Israel. What does that mean? That they put Jerusalem under the Israeli jurisdiction, the Israeli civil law, unlike the rest of the West Bank and Gaza, which has been under the military law or military uh, rule. So, so the Trump policy has really given a lot of support for the Israelis. You know, we used to go all, we used to know and say always the Americans or the American state or is the main alliance to the Israel. But since Trump, we have been witnessing a partnership between the American administration and the Israeli government, especially as you know, we have been really facing the right wing and uh, the alliance between the right wing and extreme right um, uh, Israeli government for the last uh, uh, for the last uh, years. You know, more than that. In addition to that, you know, we have been seeing or we have been facing the what what so called the American proposal or the historical deal. What he called it the historical deal for the Palestinian Israeli conflict. You know, this, this deal really which support or encourage the an annexation of the occupied territories. It encourage the annexation of the Jordan Valley. It is, and it's really encouraged the annexation of Area C, which is nearly, which is nearly 40% uh, of the uh, occupied territory, you know, where all the settlement. It denies the Palestinian right for self-determination, de and even it doesn't address or it doesn't talk about it will uh, uh, it will cancel 
the Palestinian state, the future Palestinian state. So this, this, this American policy or this American proposal, which has been both are the American has been trying to force the Palestinian to accept, but all the Palestinian, all the groups, the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian group have been against the American historical, what so called historical deal, and they have been rejecting all this policy by the Americans and the Israelis. So with regard to this violation or these policies that has been really increasing or has been, it has been escalating by the Israeli institution, the Israeli government, one of the main policy is land confiscation and building settlements. So during, during as you might know, by now Israel or the Israeli government is controlling and using 87% of all the land of occupied East Jerusalem. So one third of the land has been confiscated for building Israeli Jewish settlements. In East Jerusalem, there are 15 huge settlements. There are nearly 220,000 Jewish settlers who they are living in East Jerusalem. But with the year 2020, there has been, I mean, the Israeli municipality of Jerusalem and the Israeli planning committee, they have been approving over 6,500 settlement unit only in occupied East Jerusalem. So there has been approving several plans to expand the settlements which are already exist, you know, and the, some of the plans that they have approved in the Israeli government and the Israeli uh, planning committee with the municipality of Jerusalem. You know, one of the one of the settlement is called Gavat Matos. It's been supposed to be built at Beit Safafa in the north of Jerusalem. This settlement they are talking now to start with 1,275 housing unit for the settlements. It will separate and isolate Jerusalem from Bethlehem, from the north, Bethlehem and Hebron. Another, another settlement is E1. E1 is a settlement which the plan talks about 3,600 3, settlements, hotels and shopping centers in the east of Jerusalem. So they have been approving the start of 1,100 units. This settlement will separate Jerusalem from the eastern side of the West Bank, from Jericho, from the Jordan Valley and Jordan. And then there is another settlement, which is in the north of Jerusalem. It's called Atarot. It's in the land which used to be like the airport of Jerusalem. That this settlement, the plan is to build 9,000 housing units for the Israeli Jewish uh, groups. Uh, in this area, you know, by building these three, four settlements, they will be surrounding the city of Jerusalem and isolating Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank and the rest of the occupied territories. So, uh, so in addition to that, as well, Ramat Shlomo, Abu Ghnem, and you know what, we are, what they are trying to achieve now? You know, now they are talking about Greater Jerusalem. Greater Jerusalem, is the city of Jerusalem. They want to add to the city of Jerusalem three major blocks of settlement, one in the south called Gosh Atyon, in the east E1 Ma'ale Adumim, and in the north Gevaz Zeb. And part of this greater Jerusalem, they want to remove three Palestinian communities or neighborhoods that are part of Jerusalem. They want to remove them from being part of Jerusalem. You know, by doing that, what they are trying to achieve, you know, always in all the Israeli policies, there is what we call it the demographic element or the demographic objective. You know, always they try to achieve Jerusalem with a Jewish majority and vis-a-vis -a, -vis a small minority of Arab Palestinians. So by doing that, there will be 80 percent Israeli Jewish and 20 percent Palestinian Arabs. And this is the main strategy, is the main, the main 
strategy, the main, the big picture that Israel has been working or trying to achieve in East Jerusalem. You know, of course, you know now with the, all this land confiscation and land control, this has been affecting the housing right for the Palestinian. As we said, only 13% of the land of East Jerusalem is left for the use of the Palestinian for building, for housing, for commercial. And in addition to the shortage of land, you know, we have been, people in Jerusalem have been facing a lot of restriction on obtaining building permit. It's a very complicated, it takes a long time. I mean, it costs a lot of money just to get the permission to build a house. So it is very complicated, it's nearly impossible. And, and because of that, people, they have no choice. They build without a permission. You know, in East Jerusalem, they are nearly 20 to 22,000 homes or house that have been built without a permission. You know, what does that mean? According to the Israeli law, according to the Israeli, all these houses must be demolished. You know, people can't get permission. There is no permits that they don't provide the people, the community with a permit, but if you build without a permit, you should, your home should be demolished. So just to mention some numbers, in 2020, the Israeli municipality, they have been demolishing 161 structure, including 120 residential house, making 328 people homeless, including 182 children. Can you imagine, I mean, this is only until October of 2002. In, in, in 2019, they demolished 265 structures, including 169 residential homes, and they displaced 328 people, including 190 children. So this is just the numbers about the home demolition that has been going on. As I told you, we used to consider 2019 is one of the highest in the rate of demolition, but even in spite of the corona and what's going on now with the, all this situation, there has been an increase more than in 2019, uh, there has been an increase in home demolition. And there are several homes or neighborhoods in East Jerusalem that are under eviction. You know, one of the neighborhoods is Sheikh Jarrah. It's one of the neighborhoods we are, we are providing legal aid. This Sheikh Jarrah, there are 68 families that they are under the risk of eviction because there are some Israeli settler group, they claim they own the land. So there has been many rulings in favor of the settlers and they have been evicting their families just during September, October and November. There were three eviction orders against 12 families from Sheikh Jarrah. 87 people, including 35 children, now they are facing the eviction at any minute. So what we are trying, we have been struggling to try to prevent the eviction of these families from their home. I mean, this case has been going on for more than 15 or 20 years. And the lawyers, I mean, the, the legal institution are trying to prevent the eviction of these families. You know, Al Bustan Silwan is another neighborhood. It's in the south of the old city. It has been targeted by the settler movement. Uh, Al Bustan is 130 family, 88 buildings. There is a demolition order for all the buildings and all the neighborhood. You know why? Because there is a plan to build a Talmudic park because they believe that King David has been was walking on this area. So they want to make 130 family homeless because they think or they believe that King David was walking or was tooling in, the, in this area. In Silwan only, there are five neighborhoods either under eviction or under demolition. So, so you can imagine 
all these policies that are really targeting the Palestinians and trying to displace them and to force them to leave their, their homes and the neighborhood where they live. I mean, housing, land confiscation, home demolition, as well as the residency right has been targeted or affected by the Palestinians. You know, by now, you know, one of the policies that Israeli are using is revoking the Palestinian residency in East Jerusalem. They have been putting a lot of conditions, a lot of restriction where they can revoke your residency. And if you travel more than six years, even if you come back every year to Jerusalem, if you get any residency or citizenship from any other country, you lose your residency. If you leave even the city of Jerusalem and you go and live in Bethlehem or Ramallah, because for example, there is a shortage of housing, the housing very expensive in East Jerusalem, they revoke your residency. Can you imagine? Nobody can go from Jerusalem and live in Bethlehem, which is only five kilometers from the city of Jerusalem, because the, the Israelis, they can revoke their residency and they lose their right from being residents of Jerusalem. You know, the numbers talk about there are nearly uh, 14,650 Palestinians from Jerusalem. They lost their residency because their residency because of that. You know, you know they added to that that uh, there was a resolution in the Knesset in 2019 where they gave the Israeli Minister of Interior the right to revoke any Palestinian Jerusalemite residency for their political activities. Can you imagine yani, anybody now with this law, it was approved in March 2018, any Palestinian in East Jerusalem, they involved in any activities, you know, they called it, of course, what they call it terrorist activities, they lose their residency and the minister has the right to revoke their res residency. Can you imagine all this, all this oppression, all these suppression laws? I mean, the Israeli government are using the laws to achieve their political objectives and uh, goals. So uh, the, the legal system in Israel, although we use the Israeli legal system trying to stop or prevent these policies or these plans, but always the legal system is supporting the Israeli government, is supporting the policy of the Israeli government. It's not, unfortunately, uh, it's not a neutral, a neutral uh, system where one can go to in order to seek uh, justice. The, the last thing is education. You know, education has been targeted by the Israelis since the first day of the Israeli occupation. You know, Israel all the time, they try to control the education system. They have been preventing Palestinians from building schools, the same as they are preventing us or restricting our right to build homes. Because of that, the, according to statistics, there is a shortage of 2,020 classroom for Palestinian students in East Jerusalem. And you know what they have been doing during the last seven, eight years, they have been trying to change the curriculum, the textbook that we are using. You know, they have been trying to impose an Israeli curriculum on the Palestinian school in occupied East Jerusalem. You know, you know, in this textbook, they don't, if you go through the textbook from grade one to 12, you will never find the term Palestinian people at all. Even they don't recognize us as a people. They talk about the Jewish history. They talk about the Israeli leaders. They talk about the Israeli, what they call it, the 67 war, the war of independent or the 48. They talk about the, the Israeli settlement, but they never talk about the Palestinians because they know very well by targeting the education, they are targeting the Palestinian national identity. You know, they are changing the school textbook. They are changing the names of the neighborhoods. They are changing the names of the street to replace them with a Jewish Israeli names. 
this is part of occupying the mentality, the thinking, the national identity. You know, it's, 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 it's one of the most dangerous threat that Palestinians in Jerusalem are using, that they are trying to force them to lose their national identity, their history, their narrative, their, uh, uh, their all what's related to them as a, as, a Palestinian, as a Palestinian. So with all these, I am sure I, I have been long, with all these violations, what we do as a coalition, the coalition was established in 2005. We monitor all the Israeli plans, policies, laws that are implemented in occupied East Jerusalem. And we go further, we do awareness raising for our community, we try to empower the local communities in their neighborhoods, we try to support them, to provide for them support in order to resist and challenge the Israeli occupation. The second thing we do, we have a team of lawyers where we go and challenge the Israeli plans. We challenge, as I told you, we challenge the general public cases. We go to the court to try to challenge them, to stop the eviction, to stop their demolition of their homes, to stop uh, revoking residency. You know, we try to help, uh, to help in uh, trying to allow people to access to Jerusalem, you know, because as, uh, as you might know, Jerusalem now is completely surrounded by military checkpoint and by the separation or wall, the separation wall which was built around Jerusalem. So it is like a big prison. And by doing that, they deny the right of 4 million Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza to access to the city, to access to the holy places, to Al-Aqsa, to the church, to the holy sepulcher church, and to Al-Aqsa mosque, and to the holy places by the closer of Jerusalem. Nobody can access unless they obtain um, a permit from the military, Israeli military administration, which is very difficult and very complicated. Can you imagine settlers who are coming from Europe, from Europe, from Canada, from the US, they have the right to stay in Jerusalem more than the people who they have been living for years, their ancestors, their grandparents, their grandparents for hundreds of years, we, they have been living in Jerusalem. Though those people, the people, the Palestinians are really denying their right to live in their city. So we provide legal aid to stop this and change the Israeli policies. Then the last thing, we do international legal advocacy. We work with the United Nations. We work with the UN mechanism, with the Human Rights Council in Geneva, with the European Union, with the European state, with the European diplomatic and the international diplomatic missions in Palestine. You know, because we know that it is a political problem and we need the support of the international community and the international mechanism to stop all these violations and to stop all this continu continuous Israeli policy. You know, all these policies that Israel is doing, is it has one main goal and aim. It, it, what we are going through, we are really going through or we are facing a colonial settler apartheid regime, which aiming to force displace the people, our people in Jerusalem and a, a policy of population transfer. It is an ethnic cleansing policy that Palestinians uh, in Jerusalem in particular and Palestinians in all Palestine are facing through by or in the hand of the Israeli government. So the last thing is really the way your work and our trust is in you as activists, as groups, as supporters to put pressure to support our struggle, to support our people in our struggle against Israeli colonization, occupation, racism. You know, it's not only we are facing uh, ethnic cleansing and displacement and population transfer, but as well, we face discrimination and apartheid in all our daily lives. So thank you for your work. And we hope that through your work, you put pressure on the Canadian government 
on other governments on you as well to take action to stop and put pressure on Israel to stop all these policies and all these violations. Thank you very much. I just want to thank you so much, um, Zakaria, for your um, incredible words and uh, really looking forward to hearing more from you in, uh, in, the, uh, in the discussion, which is upcoming. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is Yusuf al Nachi. Yusuf was born and raised in Jerusalem. Uh, Dr. Nachi received his PhD from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS in 1997, specializing in Ottoman architecture. Subsequently, he was appointed director of the prestigious Department of Tourism and Archaeology at the Al Haram Al Sharif in Jerusalem. He serves as a lecturer at Al Quds University, supervising numerous master's theses. Uh, Dr. Nachi is an active council member of many Palestinian societies focused on architectural heritage in Jerusalem. In this capacity, he frequently serves as a consultant for projects related to Jerusalem. Dr. Nachi has published several books and more than 60 articles focused on Jerusalem's architectural heritage, including the well-received architectural survey of Jerusalem's Ottoman architecture published in 2000 and the recently published book entitled the dis, uh, in, entitled The Discovering of Jerusalem's Secrets, Walking Trails Through the Old City and Beyond. We are so excited to have you here. Welcome, Yusuf. Thank you very much for such an introduction. I am so pleased uh, I will be with you. Thank you very much for organizing, for inviting me. And being between Zachariah and Jonathan, it is a virtue. And I hope that in my speech, it will be enjoyable, informative, and I am ready to many, any comments or questions. However, speaking about the city with such a deep heritage, with the a tremendous uh, really narrative it's really a challenge to put it in about 15 minutes or 20 minutes but uh, depending on your insight and in your background i hope that i will try to touch as much as possible what is expected from me and what i understand uh, from the organizer that I supposed to give a brief idea about the city, a really uniqueness about the importance of the Haram Sharif in Quds in general, and then to tackle the threats or the dangers which is surrounding the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the old city of Jerusalem in general. I, I would like to say that really Jerusalem is a unique city and so far and till recently I used to say to my audience to my visitor at the Aqsa Mosque or to my students that this city has been sanctified three times but more recently in my uh, just last book I started something else, or I really emphasize a new things, that this city actually has been sanctified four times. Because from its first construction, and from its really beginning, which used to be 2000 years before BC, which is, has 400 years, 4,000 years old, the city, Actually, the Canaanite city was named Jerusalem, the city of Salem or Shalem. And from this name, Urshalim or Jerusalem or Jerusalem has been taken. And we know from many scholars, many few scholars, who says that the name of the city, Jerusalem or or Salem, it means that this Salem is the God of the city who protect it. And it is really understandable or understood as being the 
a star in the sky. And I have a, a witness from Franken, a, one of the scholars who really uh, concentrated his work about Jerusalem as early as possible. He says, I cite, it is pretty possible that certain ideas which considered Jerusalem to be the spiritual center of the reverse could be retained back in the Canaanite period even before David has really occupied the city. So this is the face of the city from its beginning. It is really attached, connected with religion, with the spirits, and spirituality. And surely later, this city has been three times sanctified by the Abrahamic religion or the monistic religion, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. It is so important for all the followers of these three religions. And it's really a city which I grew up and consider, though it is grounded in earth, but surely its roots really are attached to heaven. Why? Because whenever you speak with a person who uh, uh, consider Jerusalem is his city, his identification is holiness, always he is trying to convince you that the city has a unique status being so important, so vital for the narrative, for the principles of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It is a city, really, which has occupied the minds of the people all over the time. It really inflamed writers and inspired uh, poets which make them to comply as much as possible literature about the city. So the city, though it is in air, but it is rooted in the sky or the heaven. And always, whenever you speak to someone, he is really sick. And it's not an odd to consider it like this, because from its really hills from the Mount of Olives, we know that Jesus Christ had ascended to heaven. Also, Muhammad, peace be upon him, also uh, has his main vital miracle in the minds and the face of the Muslims, really on its spot. However, what I would like to say that Jerusalem is a city for the monistic, for the three religion, but these three religions really, through history, has competed first with the pagan religion and the principle, and then also the city really suffered from their rivals and from their a certain attitude, which we recently witnessed the utmost of the selectiveness and the uh, being Jerusalem identified just by a group or a sort of religion, not to be as a city of peace. However, what I would like to say that the city is so important, as I mentioned, but in my speech, in my brief speech, I would like to concentrate on Islam. Not because it's Christianity or Judaism is not important, but because it's the limited of time and because the suffering is really for both, but most concentrated in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Haram Sharif, Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the name to giving to uh, uh, that spot and that place is so important for Muslims. For uh, Islam, for uh, Muslims, Jerusalem is so important. Why it's so important? 
because according to Muslim beliefs, it's holiness. It's not that a group of people who agreed among themselves that it is a holy site. No, according to the understanding of the Muslim, it is God which mentioned in the Quran that it is a blessed site and it is has been thank you for the, the uh, place and you can see in the just the horizon here where is the narrow this is the old city uh, of jerusalem and uh, this is the damascus gate which receives the people who are approaching the city from the north and an architecture which is really a mixture between roman hadrian and Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, which really reflects the development and the historic development and the historical architecture of the city. So for Muslims, it is Allah who blessed the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And also, as Zafar said in the introduction, it is so important because the only physical miracle of Prophet Muhammad took place in uh, the city of Jerusalem in Al-Aqsa Mosque. And if the time allows, surely this uh, miracle is so important for Muslims, not because it is something which needs a superpower to be fulfilled to be as a miracle, but the implication and the circumstances which surrounded Jerusalem and the uh, miracle is so important in Islam. And Muslims keep saying that God could make the ascension of Muhammad from any spot. So why Jerusalem was chosen? And the answer is so easy because Islam considered Jerusalem is a city of the Prophet, a city of David, a city of Solomon, a city of Jesus Christ, and Islam consider themselves Muslim as a continuation of such things. And you have to remember that Prophet Muhammad used to pray in Mecca, but never ever being practicing prayer five times a day. In Jerusalem, in the ascension, in the miracle, at that time, God, according to understanding of Islam, asked Muslims, asked Prophet Muhammad, to ask Muslims to pray five times daily. So it has really many implications, this. So the night journey is so important. And what I would like to emphasize with you also, that when Muslims took Jerusalem, they are so proud. Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, all over the world keep reiterating that contrary to many conquerors who took Jerusalem with the bloodshed, with siege, with the prisoner, Muslims and Islam took the city peacefully, took the city according to a peace agreement, the Accord of Omar, which also Arab Christians are so proud about it, and they keep really uh, pointing to it as coexistence, as an integral part of the holy land of the city. In addition to that, also Jerusalem used to be the first Qibla. And Qibla is so important in Islam because it is an essential part of any Muslim prayer. You have to make sure that your direction is really young. And also, in addition to that, Muslims keep saying that when they took Jerusalem, they never ever distracting a standing building. They just came to a spot which is so important for them, commemorating the night journey. And it used to be vacant without any major or minor architectural project on the Haram al-Sharif. Since the destruction of the city by Tita 70 AD, we don't know so far, according to best of the archaeology and travelers, about any architectural project apart from having a small pagan temple in the area of Al-Aqsa Mosque. We don't know who really constructed it when it was disappeared. And so far, 
for these reasons and taking the city in a peaceful agreement and since the Christian community continued to live in Jerusalem, the only suitable space used to be, need to develop, used to be Al Haram Sharif. So sometimes I am approached with some questions we say, uh, which keep saying, weren't the Muslims sensitive enough that they choose to build just in the site where the temple, according to a Jewish point of view, has been? And we answer them simply, this is a holy site for Muslims. And this area was neglected for 550 years. And this is all the uh, really treaties says about it. So taking in consideration the Tibla, the Isra Mi'raj, the blessing of Allah, the attitude of Omar, the peaceful attitude of Omar, Jerusalem really considered in the heart of the Muslims and it is really architecture. However, to sum up also uh, about the importance of the city, it is also connected and considered to be the homeland of Ibrahim, which is considered to be the father of the Arabs and world. And it is also uh, something. What I would like to say that also Muslims consider uh, Jesus Christ as a prophet and in the uh, Dome of the Rock, which is the most important building in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ is mentioned, his mother Mary in the inscription also, and that really is something, though there are certain different, but it is so respected difference that we don't know any other holy site as important as the Dome of the Rock, which really narrate about Jesus Christ and its nature and about his mother Mary uh, uh, the, as an example of really a good manner and ethics. Jerusalem is so important, not just from religious point of view, in fact, it is also in the minds of the local Jerusalemists who used to live in Jerusalem before 1000 years. There is a very important witness which I would like to read for you just very brief to show that it is not just the religious dimension which belongs, which Palestinians, which Arabs, which Muslims really admire Jerusalem. No, it is also their city, their social life. One of the best authors in Islamic geography is a Jerusalemist. His book is considered one of the best, if it is not the best in among the Arab geographical he said in Maqdisi, which means, one day I was among selected scholars and consul with elected just Yahya ibn Bahram in Basra. And we should know Basra used to be one of the best places for scholars and for culture and for discussions. And Egypt was mentioned. Till I was asked which country was greater, I said, Ours, they ask which is Tasia said, I said ours. They ask which is better, I said ours. They ask which has more bounty, I said ours. They ask which is bigger, I said ours. Members of council were surprised but told me that I am an educated man and have said unacceptable things. Then Al-Maqdisi continued to prove that all what he have said, it is really in the character of Jerusalem. And because, and just the answer, the bigger, he said, Makke, Medina, all the universe will come to Jerusalem at the day of judgment, because this is a belief which is shared by Christian, Judaism, and Islam, but it is really emphasized in Islam. So this is more or less uh, actually uh, gives us an idea about Jerusalem and it's really Al-Aqsa Mosque, its churches, its small allies, its small streets, 
Jerusalem and Aqsa Mosque for a Muslims, for an Arabs, it has a different meanings. Really, one of the men really uh, uh, believes that it is an identification. It is something that you are proud when you are really uh, identified to Jerusalem and it's Now, I would like to tackle with certain threats or harassment or uh, difficulties which really faces uh, Jerusalem, the old city in general, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, all the holy sites. And being, speaking just on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it doesn't mean that the churches, the other uh, heritage uh, is not under threat. Just two days ago, we uh, witnessed a sad, uh, really, event, incident, when a fanatic uh, a Jewish person tried to put an aroused fire in one of the most important churches of Jerusalem outside of the old city, the church of Gethsemane, the church of all the nations at that time. And we have a series of events really, which uh, both uh, churches, clergymen has suffered a lot. So, and also the uh, Christian Muslims committee, they keep documenting such an attacks or harassment or uh, really uh, threats about these things. Anyone could really follow the, uh, every month they issued a report. So for us, Jerusalem in general, Al-Aqsa Mosque in particular, is really in a prison. Zakaria mentioned the big prison, and I would like to mention the small prison. It is an Aqsa Mosque, which is constitute one third of the, one sixth of the old city of Jerusalem. Whenever you are approaching the mosque from any of its 11 gates, you will face with cameras, you will face with an heavy escorted policemen, uh, police border, uh, secrets and the moment you are approaching that you have to show your identity you have to be answer the question so you will lose your spirit it is a mosque it is not a place which you will be integrated and you will be losing the moment of prayer which you are going really to concentrate and you are going to visit to perform a prayer or to enjoy an architecture or to, uh, so it's a hindering of the access and we really suffer from what the Israeli security between two practice policies which when he allow uh, access to al aqsa according to age and aging if you are 45 years according to their estimation you are allowed if you are less, you are not allowed. So if you are accompanying your brother or uh, your uh, uh, daughter or your son, maybe you will be allowed, you will not be allowed. This is in a Friday prayer. One of the most important uh, challenges which, and the practices which Al-Aqsa Mosque has witnessed in the last 10 years really, and it's augmenting in every month and in every week, I am not exaggerating. It is the endless effort of the Israeli police authority to change the status quo, which should reveal the fragile status quo, which should reveal the Aqsa Mosque from 1967 up to 2000. And we have endless, endless examples about what this, all of this in order to end that Al-Aqsa Mosque, it will be just a facade for the Arabs and the Muslim, and it will be uh, really controlled totally by the Israeli police. You can't imagine, you can't comprehend, I challenge you that some odd behavior of the police towards the Awqaf administration, towards the Muslims, towards the uh, royal custodian of uh, King Abdullah towards Al-Aqsa Mosque. Even we are not allowed to change an oil lamp or to fix a tap of water 
without the approval of the police, without the hindering. Even just two weeks ago, the commander of the police approached Mr. Azam al Khatib and he threatened him, saying that not a cup of water will be allowed to enter Al Aqsa Mosque. Imagine the hindering of the maintenance project, the restoration projects, how we are allowed to make access for our material. This is a vivid sight. This is a living sight. This is something spiritual. People are there. And uh, so it needs constant maintenance and anything which will take really a week. It takes months from us. And they are really pressing the Okaf administration to the extent that really we keep complaining, we keep our patient because our main task, our main mission, our belief that we should really maintain the peace in Al-Aqsa Mosque, in the Holy Land. And we believe that holy sites, which means a lot of the people in their beliefs, in their mental life, should not be a matter of a challenging or to be politicized for that reason. So, so just giving you an example about visiting. Brother Yusuf? Yes. Brother Yusuf, yes, I think we are running out of time. So if you could okay, please wrap up in a minute. One minute and I will sum up. Jazakallah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it is the provoca uh, provocation, the ideological visits. Our tough administration, we, we are not against anyone to visit, provided that he will behave as he will do in any holy site all over the world to show respect, not to come with a message of uh, destructing Al Aqsa Mosque, moving it to Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia, and to build the third temple. And they are coming for not. Uh, showing or being identified with the area, they are coming in order to really make more steps to rebuild the third temple, which an issue which really occupying and terrifying the Palestinians who are really responsible for Al Aqsa Mosque. And to sum up the tunnels, the excavation, the, the challenge, the battle about the landscape of the city, the appearance of the city, the nature of the appearance, all of these are daily matters which an art historian or the Okaf administration or anyone who cares for the spirit of Jerusalem, its past, its recent will take really, the challenges are so much and some of the photographs which I tried to bring with you show certain evidences about the fears, the threats, and the situation in Aqsa Mosque, which is really a mini a picture about the situation in Jerusalem, in the Palestinian territory also. And thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf, for that very enlightening uh, presentation regarding Al-Haram Al-Sharif in Al-Quds, Jerusalem. And uh, now we move to our next panelist, uh, who is uh, Jonathan Katab, who is the co-founder of the Palestinian Human Rights Group Al-Haq and co-founder of Nonviolence International. Uh, a well-known international human rights attorney, he has practiced in the United States, Palestine, and Israel. He serves on the board of Bethlehem Bible College and is president of the board of uh, the Holy Land Trust. He's also a co-founder and board member of Just Peace Advocates, a Canadian-based human rights organization. And of course, uh, Jonathan has just written a new book. It's called Beyond the Two-State Solution, a link for which is available on uh, our uh, webinar uh, website. And uh, Jonathan Katab's decades of legal advice and creative activism has led him to write this very important book. Uh, he says to change the future, um, you, we must change the conversation. So, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to say how impressed I am with a very large group of uh, participants from all over the world. I'm equally impressed that they are willing to uh, 
be on Zoom for such a long time. I know how uh, tiring it is. And uh, my contribution will be uh, to try and limit myself strictly to the time, however difficult that is, and to also strictly limit myself to the topic, uh, which is the specific dangers to Al-Aqsa and to Jerusalem. Uh, I will uh, speak specifically from the perspective of uh, the legal arrangements and the international law that applies to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and speaking now about East Jerusalem today, is, is, is in a very unique and uh, very difficult position because Israel illegally and contrary to international law has annexed Jerusalem without fully annexing it. They created a special status for it whereby they apply Israeli law and sovereignty to it illegally, but they don't grant rights or citizenship to its population. Instead, they treat them as residents, but not citizens. And they work very hard to try and deprive them even of that residency. They also prevent the Palestinian Authority, as well as the rest of the Palestinian community, to have contact with and support for and access to Jerusalem. Uh, they, they even passed a law uh, preventing the Palestinian Authority from having anything to do with Jerusalem. And, and any activity that takes place in Jerusalem can be shut down just by claiming that the Palestinian Authority supports it, uh, even in a moral sense of the word. So the people in East Jerusalem, there's about 350,000 of them now, are truly orphans. They don't have a government to support them. They cannot have even the Israeli government, uh, unlike citizens of Israel, because they don't accept that it has been uh, a part of Israel. They can't connect and continue with the West Bank or with the Palestinian Authority. They don't have their own leaders in any way, and only civil society like Zakaria's coalition of civil society can provide them even the very basis for everyday life. So it's a very difficult and unique position, but at the same time, they are an integral part of the Palestinian people, and they feel the burden of maintaining the Palestinian character of Jerusalem and especially its holy sites. So this is the first point that I wanted to make, how difficult it is to be a Palestinian today in East Jerusalem. The second point that I want to make is that the status of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock is such a difficult position because when Israel first occupied East Jerusalem, they were very careful. They did not want to come into conflict with the Islamic world. Zionism as a basically political movement, it's not a religious movement, did not want a religious conflict over the holy site. In fact, they announced that people of the Jewish faith are not even allowed on the mosque for fear that they may desecrate it by stepping over uh, what could be the Holy of Holies uh, in, 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 in ancient times. So the state of Israel as a political entity initially did not want a conflict over the holy sites. There was a very small, tiny minority of fanatics that were very carefully watched by the Israeli government who really wanted to destroy the, the, the holy uh, sites and to build a third temple. But they were considered a fringe minority. This, however, has changed. And this is where the danger that we feel today comes from. This has changed because of two reasons. First, Israeli policies have moved 
towards the extreme right. Religious fanatics, who are used to be a small fringe minority, have now become an accepted part of the government. And in fact, they have become the ones who dictate to the government what to do when it comes to especially Jerusalem and the holy places. This is really scary because their brand of religious fanaticism is less religious than it is nationalistic. They feel the power uh, of uh, their control over the holy site, and they want to exert that power. Well, there are some secular Israelis and hopefully some people in government who realize how dangerous it is to turn this into a religious war. Uh, but, but they say, why not? Maybe we can do it. Maybe we have the power to do it. Why shouldn't we do it? So you see, on the one hand, a tremendous shift to the right wing that, that creates a real danger. But there's also another element, which is the weakness of the Arab and the Muslim world, as well as the international community. The international community has specifically failed to put any controls over Israeli excesses. Every time Israel does something in Jerusalem <coughs> or in Palestine, the United States is there to provide a veto at the United Nations. It is there to prevent bringing action in international fora. Governments in recent, the last four years, especially with the Trump administration, as well as the Canadian government, which has really broken with its own traditions, has broken with the international community and joined the United States in providing basically a carte blanche for Israel to do exactly whatever it wants to do with little or no restriction whatsoever on what it can do. So when you have a failure of the international uh, community to act, a weakness of the Arab countries, especially when some of them even begin the process of normalization without addressing the justice issues of the Palestinians, the average Israeli says, why should we care? Why should we care about international law? Why should we care about the Palestinians and, and the residents of Jerusalem? Why should we care about Muslims and the Muslim world? They are willing to normalize their relation with us. And even if they don't normalize, they are willing to be quiet and to allow us to do everything we want. That, that creates a situation of impunity, that we can violate international law without paying a price. We can violate the feelings of Muslims and Christians throughout the world without paying a price. We can do whatever we want without any consequences. So the combination of right-wing behavior together with immunity, and impunity towards international law creates a tremendously dangerous situation. Now, I can tell you specifically about the consequences. What does that mean when that happens? I can tell you about the suffering of the Palestinians because by applying Israeli law without providing uh, protections or political rights to Palestinians in East Jerusalem, that means that they cannot build without a license from Israel. They cannot gather or carry out their normal activities without uh, uh, Israeli approval. They cannot even obtain assistance from others because they are being cut off, as I said, and they are being orphaned. So uh, the result, of course, is, is what we see. We see people being shot and killed. We see houses being destroyed. We see zoning and planning that favors the Judaization of the city of Jerusalem. We see an openly declared policy 
that this state is of the Jews and for the Jews and only for the Jews. It is not an issue of sharing with, with other people. It's not an issue of faith communities being together and acting together on the basis of equality. No, it is based on exclusivity. This is ours and ours alone. This belongs only to the Jewish people. And I say that knowing that those who are propor uh, pro uh, proponents of this view are not speaking out of a religious Jewish interest, but rather out of an interest of power and control. This is ours and ours alone. That being the situation, it is really a very uh, difficult and a sad situation. Jerusalem should be a city of peace. Jerusalem should be an open city for people to join. Jerusalem should be a light to the nations instead of being the exclusive control. Now, as a, as, as a student of history, I know that throughout history, different uh, denominations, different religions have claimed the city of Jerusalem in the name of their God. And they have persecuted those of other uh, religions. The Crusaders did it, where they persecuted uh, the Jews, the Muslims, as well as Christians who are from different denominations, because their interest was in the name of God to carry out uh, political acts of control and imperialism. Now, there is a very fragile situation that exists in Jerusalem that was codified in the past century uh, under a document called the Status Quo Arrangement that tried very carefully to determine which denomination and which religion has which rights over which sites. And that is a situation that has been more or less workable and acceptable. Any attempts to change that by means of force, because we are in power and we are in control, threatens a very fragile peace. So uh, with this, I will end. As I promised, I will keep myself to my uh, time. Uh, there are many issues to be raised, and I'm sure many questions to be raised. Uh, but I want to thank those who put this together, thank the organizations who supported it, and thank all of you who are listening uh, for this long time. Thank you. So our next speaker I'm delighted to uh, introduce is Aziza Kanji. Um, Aziza is a legal, academic, and journalist. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and Masters of Law, specializing in Islamic Law from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Aziza's work focuses on issues relating to racism, law, and social justice. Welcome, Aziza. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca and the organizers, my fellow panelists, and thank you to all of you who are here today sharing virtual space in resistance of the politics of erasure that prevails in Israel's policies against the Palestinians. I want to begin with salam, words of peace, and the most important word of peace is to say that I will be keeping also my comments brief today. We are gathered here to talk about the assault on Al-Quds, literally the holy city. And so we must also remember that for those of us who are here in Canada, we talk about the assault on Al-Quds on land that is seeing a continual assault on the sacred sites and land and spaces of the indigenous peoples who have been the guardians of these territories for many thousands of years. I'm speaking to you from Toronto which has been the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of New Credit for many thousands of years. But all across this land that now calls itself Canada, indigenous nations from the Sequepmuk and the Wet'suwet'en resisting colonial pipelines, to the Haudenosaunee at 1492 Land Back Lane, to the Algonquin Moose Protectors, all across this land now that now calls itself Canada, indigenous peoples are resisting the politics of indigenous erasure and the desecration of land, water, climate, and ecosystems that lies at the very heart 
of all systems of settler colonial rule from Turtle Island to Palestine. Across the Canadian political spectrum, we constantly hear this refrain over and over again, that Canada and Israel are ideologically united and are bound by deep values that they share. We should take the self-description and the self-identification seriously because it tells us something very important about the regimes of violence that connect these two systems and these two states. For example, in the Memorandum of Understanding implementing the Canada-Israel Strategic Partnership, which articulates the desire for Canada and Israel to work closely together on issues of defense, counterterrorism, uh, border security, and public safety. In this Memorandum of Understanding, it begins by stating that Canada and Israel are, quote, built on a shared commitment to a common set of core values, principles, and interests, such as democracy, free markets, security, peace, justice, human rights, and freedom. This absolutely exemplifies the long trajectory of colonial discourse using ideas such as democracy and human rights and freedom and weaponizing them to justify systems of oppression and dispossession against the colonized. We get a better idea of what these terms mean in the lexicon of colonial discourse when we look at the practices that connect Canada to Israel in the names of these uh, values. What does democracy mean? Democracy means that Israel, this state which meets the legal definition of apartheid, is constantly exalted in Canadian discourse as the only democracy in the Middle East. While at the very same time, Canada refuses to recognize the outcome of the exercise of Palestinians' democratic will when it goes against the interests of the state of Israel. And simultaneously, the Canadian political and media class ignores the democratic will of the Canadian people who overwhelmingly support justice for Palestinians, instead maintaining this artificial consensus of absolute solidarity with Israel that enables impunity for its international crimes. Free markets. Free markets in this context means the removal of any barriers to enrichment from the dispossession of the Palestinian people and the settlement and annexation of their lands. For example, in the Canada-Israel free, free Trade Agreement, which permits goods that have been manufactured in Israel settlements to be accorded the preferential treatment of goods that have been manufactured in Israel in contravention of this basic principle of international law that no state should recognize as lawful a situation created by a serious breach of international law, which includes Israel's policies of occupation. And yet the Canadian government is going to court in order to ensure that wines made in Israel settlements can continue to bear the label made in Israel in violation of this basic principle of international law that states must distinguish between goods made illeg in illegal settlements versus goods made in Israel. And so while there was outrage recently about Mike Pompeo going to Israel and saying that goods in settlements should be able to bear the label made in Israel, this extremist position of the United States is what Canada has been permitting to do all along. Security. What does security mean in the context of colonial discourse? Security means that the same Israeli companies that have profited from building the illegal separation wall that, that mutilates Palestinian territories and separates Palestinian communities from each other and steals Palestinian land, the same company that has profited from building this wall is the Canadian subsidiary of which provides the perimeter securing equipment for Corrections Canada for the prisons and jails that continue to incarcerate ever-growing numbers of Indigenous and Black people in Canada. This company, Senstar, 
boasts about producing enough fencing to encircle the globe once over. And truly, this is fencing that connects Canada to Palestine. What if this value of peace that unites Canada and Israel? Peace here really means little more than the violent pacification of resistance to oppression, exemplified in the Canada-Israel relationship in the trading and circulation of police tactics between Canada and Israel, as well as the circulation and trading of weaponry, so that the drones that terrorize the people of Gaza are fueled by engines that have been made in Canada by Pratt & Whitney Canada. And now yeah. those same Israeli companies that make those drones are pitching them to provide them to the Canadian military here in Canada in order to secure Canada's own colonial sovereignty. Justice, the value of justice. What does justice mean? Justice means that those who exercise solidarity with the most basic rights of the Palestinians are punished, whether if not in the court of law, in the court of media, or the court of public opinion, or the court of politicians, or the court of parliament. Palestine solidarity is punished, while Canadian courts exercise all means possible to prevent corporations' violations of Palestinian rights from being heard in Canadian courts, while at the same time, the Canadian government has been working to thwart Israel being brought before the International Criminal Court for its war crimes and crimes against humanity. In its letter to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, encouraging it not to open a case into Israel's violations of Palestinian rights, Canada stated that this would be inappropriate because Palestine is not a state and therefore the uh, court should have no jurisdiction over these crimes. Perversely, we see how the very source of the ongoing violence and injustice against the Palestinians, the denial of their self-determination is cited by Canada, a colonial state, in order to justify Palestinians not having access to the institutions of justice. And so the very source of the harm is being used as a reason to perpetuate it. Then there are human rights, this value of human rights than Canada and Israel share. Human rights in Canada's vision looks like Canada continuing to vote time and time again against UN resolutions that are upholding the most basic rights of the Palestinian people rights that are supposedly reflected in Canada's own foreign policy, its own official policy on Israel-Palestine, and yet which Canada continues to deny in contravention and opposition to the overwhelming majority of the international community. The novelist Arundhati Roy warned that human rights was becoming an impoverished version of justice. So that, for example, we talk about justice for Americans, but just human rights for, uh, uh, for Afghans. But in the context of Palestine, we see how even talking about the most basic human rights for Palestinians has become impermissible. So that advocacy for things that are recognized as the floor of what people are entitled to in international law, the right to self-determination, the right to equality, the right for refugees to return, are advocating for these most basic things is represented as not only off the table, but is denounced as being anti-Semitic. And so when we're talking about defending human rights, what has really been defended is what the uh, academics Nev Gordon and Nev uh, Nicola Perigini refer to as Israel's human right to dominate. Israel's manipulation of human rights norms to justify their ongoing dispossession and domination of the Palestinian people. This brings us to the last value that Canada and Israel claim unites them, the value of freedom, which we see really means little more than the freedom for Israel to continue its policies of apartheid and annexation by stamping out the freedom of Canadians and people around the world to protest and speak against these violations. We are seeing this in Canada right now and 
around the world with the institutionalization of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which conflates criticisms of Zionism with anti-Semitism. In Ontario, we just had the Ford government circumvent the legislative process to introduce the IRA definition, this problematic definition by order in council. We have also seen the appointment of Erwin Kotler, one of the fundamental, uh, one of the foremost proponents for the IRA definition as Canada's special envoy on anti-Semitism. Erwin Kotler has also been deeply involved in the campaign to have social media platforms such as Facebook um, and Zoom adopt the IRA definition as their operating policy. And so what we are seeing is the spread of silencing of discourse about Palestine and the silencing so go, goes so deep that we are not only silenced about talking about the violations, but we are silenced even about talking about the silencing. There is a meta silencing, a secondary level of silencing. So that while Zoom has canceled events on Palestine, it has then also gone on to cancel events talking about those cancellations. It is not only silencing, but meta silencing. From Canada, we often talk about Palestine as an issue of foreign policy, but in actuality, it pertains to issues that lie right at the heart, right at the home of our ability to exercise these basic rights of freedom of expression, of assembly, of advocacy for justice. Al-Aqsa may literally mean the farthest, but justice for indigenous peoples and for Palestinians is actually the nearest, the closest thing to us, as close as the words on our tongue, as the desire for justice in our hearts and the land beneath our feet. And so it is our work, the work that we must continue to engage in against all of the barriers that have been erected against it. It is our work to continue to unpick and to undo these threads of violence that connect and sustain settler colonial rule from Turtle Island to Palestine. Thank you and salam alaikum. So we're now moving on to the, uh, to the Q&A portion of the evening. And we have a few journalists that are interested in talking, in talking to uh, our panelists. And so we're going to be unmuting uh, their microphones so that they can uh, ask their questions. So the first question, um, the first uh, journalist that we're going to call on is Maksud from Crescent International there. Can you hear us? Actually, Bianca, we're going to Dawood Kitab first. We have Dawood on YouTube and then we'll proceed to Daniel. Okay, Dawood, please, uh, please, please ask your question. Hello, Amun. Thank you so much. The, uh, the, the outlet that you're here representing. Thank you so much. I, I work for Arab News and the um, uh, Al Monitor in Washington. My question is to Aziza. I have a great speech. I thank you very much for it. But uh, on November 20th, the Canadian government reversed its normal stand on Palestine and broke uh, with the U.S. over settlements. Can you uh, explain to us why that happened? Is it a result of change happening? Why is the Canadians finally seeing the light? Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. Um, being here in Canada, I... I don't feel like the, that the light is actually is actually so bright. The pressure on the Canadian government was great to distance itself from the populist and overtly racist policies of Donald Trump, and so it had a, a you know it voted in favor, for example, of one uh, UN resolution in favor of the self determination of the Palestinian people, but it very quickly followed that up with a series of votes against. Uh, UN resolutions supporting the rights of Palestinians, including a resolution, uh, Bianca mentioned in her introduction, uh, a resolution that uh, uh, prohibits and condemns the uh, annexation of occupied territory, uh, which is in um, gross contravention of basic international law. There was a uh, petition 
uh, or a pledge that was circulated by Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East recently asking MPs to sign on to a pledge against Israel's annexation of Palestinian territory. It was signed by a uh, majority of, of candidates, or of MPs from the, from the NDP, which is our uh, most uh, left-leaning federal party, it was signed by Green MPs, but it was only signed, uh, to my knowledge, by two Liberal MPs, uh, MPs from the, um, from the uh, party that's currently in power in Canada. And so while um, Canada may have made some symbolic gestures uh, against settlements in order to distinguish itself from the policies of Donald Trump, in actuality, the, uh, the de facto support for the settlements, uh, unfortunately, continues. Thank you so much for your question, Dawood. The, uh, the next journalist that we'll be hearing from is Daniel Z from the Canada Files. Daniel, please, please unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Welcome. So that was a really powerful speech. That was a really powerful and beautiful speech by Ajish. And uh, my question with regards to the my question with regards to the, the eviction panel is recently we've seen the weaponized the growing weaponization of anti-semitism against to suppress pro-palestinian discourse we as we see this in ontario with the adaptation of the ihra definition and it looks like the federal government will be lo looking to move forward to trying to apply this by uh, on a national scale with the appointment of urban Kotler to enforce the IHRA definition. So my question is like, uh, this is obviously against the will of the majority of the Canadian people. I've done articles on the CJPME and the independent Jewish voices surveys that show like uh, uh, plurality, never mind the overwhelming majority of Canadians strongly disagree with the government's position on Israel. They want Israel to be treated as just some, as any other human rights violator and uh, any other human who carry out these atrocities around the world. And they don't, they distrust the IHRA definition and they think that Palestinian human rights must not just be fought for, but must also be expanded on and improved. Obviously the Canadian government is going to like uh, suppress this as hard as possible. So what, how do you, what do you think are some ways in we at Canada could fight back against these efforts to, by the Canadian government to maintain settler colonialism in Israel, not just to maintain their diplomatic ties, but quite literally launching all out assault on Canadian society until the discourse to be critical of Israel is shut up and locked away. So, uh, yeah. So sh uh, should I, I can start with that? Yeah, yeah please you go ahead and if anyone else wants to join okay. in, they can do so. so. First of all, thank you. That's such an important um, question, Daniel. I want to start by emphasizing that this weaponization of anti-Semitism that we see in order to suppress solidarity with Palestinians really betrays a very selective vision and concern with anti-Semitism. Because as we're seeing around the world, the resurgence of overtly anti-Semitic neo-Nazi far-right parties, which in many cases have been the very same parties that have been pushing hardest for measures to suppress and punish and subjugate the BDS moment, we have to recognize that this is an extremely cynical and opportunistic invocation of anti-racism and anti-Semitism in order to thwart and, and stamp down on anti-racism activism against Israel's settler colonial project. Um, in Canada, we have seen successes in the community pushbacks against the institutionalization of the IRA definition. Several city councils 
uh, which had put forward motions to adopt IRA, were, uh, those motions failed because of activism from on the ground. And I want to acknowledge the tremendous work of independent Jewish voices in leading the on the ground resistance to the IRA definition. They have excellent resources on their website and through their No IRA campaign. And so at the municipal level, we've seen how citizens and people's uh, resistance has been effective in pushing back against the IRA definition. Uh, at the provincial level, uh, we assume that one of the reasons why Ford went the route of introducing uh, the IRA definition through an order in council rather than through the legislative process was because there was so much resistance and because people were uh, signing up to deputize against the IRA legislation um, um, in, the, in the process. And so instead of continuing to engage with that process, they circumvented it by uh, introducing it through executive order. And so in some ways that's also, it's, it's extremely disturbing, but it's also a sign of the, of the power of resistance in order to shut off certain avenues for adopting um, the IRA definition. In general, I think we have, the, the resistance of our political class to citizens' opinions and desire to hold Israel to account for its uh, violations of international law and its injustices against the Palestinians, the resistance to our political class to heeding the opinions of Canadians on this is a sign of weaknesses in our democracy as a whole. It's capture by corporate and other interests. In a variety of other um, areas, we also see how the Canadian government is continuing to be complicit with uh, regimes and systems uh, that are extremely oppressive from uh, India's oppression in Kashmir, uh, for example. And so I think that the bigger task for all of us is to push back against, for example, draconian counterterrorism laws that are, and other uh, forms of corporate capture of democracy that really make it difficult for our opinions as the people who are subject to the power of the Canadian government to affect its policies. Thank you, Aziza. Our oh, next uh, journalist question. Oh, sorry. Is there anyone else that wants to respond to that actually before we move on? Please, please go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, I, I think we see a very important phenomena which, which is going to be increasing in the coming days. Uh, I think the Zionist narrative, which used to be prevailing throughout the Western world, is now weakening tremendously. In Europe, it's basically they've lost the, the fight for the narrative among the population, among the intellectuals, and among uh, portions of the press. So instead, they concentrate on the top 1%. They, they concentrate on those who are in power. They concentrate on the governments rather than on the people. They've lost the battle on the public relations, at, at the uh, popular level. And so they want to push it now up to those who are in control. That is why this definition, the IHRA definition is so important because they want to say, look, it's the law. We've established that that's what the law is. This is anti-Semitism. So they can continue to suppress any advocacy on behalf of the Palestinians as being anti-Semitic. They know it's not anti-Semitic. And they know that the population doesn't accept that, but if they can form that as the standard so that the courts and the government and those who are in power can enforce it, then they can silence Palestinian advocacy. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to, uh, to answer the, the question before we move on to our next journalist? Okay, so we'll now be hearing from um, Maksud at Crescent International. Maksud, are you there? Yeah, hello, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. So my question would be mainly addressed to uh, Dr. Jonathan Kotab, and uh, the question is, how has the so-called normalization of relations between the UAE, Bahrain with Israel affected the Palestinian struggle for fundamental rights? 
Well, uh, actually, this is a continuation of my previous comment. The people in Bahrain and the people in uh, Saudi Arabia and the people in the UAE and the people in the Arab world continue to be overwhelmingly supportive of the Palestinian people and their rights. Uh, but, but again, Israel doesn't, if they can get the leaders, if they can get those who are at the top, uh, to negotiate and to deal with them, they can ignore the masses of the population, which is why the Palestinian cause is becoming, once again, the, the cause of the masses, the cause of the people, uh, the cause of uh, basically a decent and 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 uh, and and in this uh, in this uh, fashion, I am very much pleased that even among Jewish people in the West in Canada and in the United States, particularly the young people, you find a lot of support for the Palestinians because the issue is not the issue of uh, religious uh, confrontation with Judaism. It's an issue of Zionism and it's a violation of human rights. Many people, I think, even among the Palestinian community counted on the solidarity of the Arab people. Uh, and it's time for us to realize that that solidarity comes from the people, not from the governments. The governments may all end up normalizing with Israel, but the people continue to believe in the justice of our cause. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and thank you to Maksud for your question. Um, so we are, we are actually, it's 3 p.m. So we don't have very much more time uh, today in terms of our program. Uh, we have so many brilliant questions from uh, the audience. Um, I'm only gonna ask one of them because we have run out of time and that is gonna be directed to all panelists, which is what steps can people outside of Palestine take to prevent Israel's illegal acts? Jonathan, yes, please. I can, I can start. I, I think that there are very concrete steps that, that, that you can take uh, in, in your uh, countries, particularly in Canada. I would think that BDS, support for BDS is a very important step. Uh, support for uh, civil society in Jerusalem, uh, Zakaria, all day. I mean, this, this event is also a uh, fundraising event. And I hope you will look at the chat box and, and uh, donate to some of these organizations that are doing important work. Uh, support for the human rights agenda, uh, just peace advocates and others who are working for human rights, education, information. Uh, ultimately, solidarity is an act of people against those who are in power. Uh, and, and this is what, what we want to uh, ask people to continue to support. Oh, is there anyone else that would like to uh, answer that? Yes, yes, please, Yusuf. Hello, yes, you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. You know, I think uh, we believe with all these violations, with all these Israeli atrocities with all these Israeli policies that has been going on for more than not only 53 years of Israeli occupation, but even 72 years of Israeli Nakba and this displacement for the Palestinian people. I think Israel will not continue to do what it has been doing if they can see a strong, serious position by the international community. I think Israel will not, I think. Israel has been punitive and has been, uh, I mean, they feel that there is no serious objection or rejection to all these policies that has been, have been implementing on Palestine in general and in East Jerusalem in particular. So I think the solidarity work, your work, the solidarity work, your support, the Canadian organization, other organization, your pressure, your advocacy onto the Canadian government is really very important. You know, you know, when you talk about anti-Semitic, you know, this is not a new thing. You know that recently, I think Trump administration was putting a resolution to the Congress to consider BDS as anti-Semitic. So, and I, I think, 
as uh, Jonathan said, I think Israel, because they are re exposed, they are losing internationally, especially in Europe, because it's not anymore, you know, with the new technology, social media, it's very easy to spread the word to talk about all these policies. So I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's very important that all, all the work that you put a lot of pressure on the Canadian, on the Canadian uh, government, on the UN international agencies in order to try to stop. You know, it's not only Israel accountable, even international. The Canadian government is accountable. The US administration is accountable. The European governments are really accountable for what's going on in the occupied territories because it's their duty because they are signatory to all these international agreement at the United Nations level. It's their duty. Not only that, it's not enough that they are not committed these crimes, but it's their duty to stop Israel from committing all these crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Zakaria. Uh, Ziza? No, I think as uh, Canadians, we often think of Canada as intervening in these situations from a position of benevolence, that we ourselves aren't implicated in the violence, but we are extending a charitable hand to help those who are uh, oppressed and refugees. But nothing could be farther from the truth. As uh, Jonathan and the other panelists have pointed out, all systems of atrocity that are permitted to persist do so through the complicity and the collaboration with the entire international community and Canada is fundamentally a part of that. And so we see in Canada that organizations like the Jewish National Fund responsible for papering over ethnically cleansed Palestinian villages and planting forests and trees to cover up the scene of the crime, these organizations have charitable status in Canada. We see that recruitment for the Israel Defense Forces is permitted to continue to occur in Canada in violation of Canada's own domestic law that prohibits recruitment uh, for foreign um, armies on Canadian soil. And so when we think about what we can do as Canadians in solidarity with the Palestinian people, I think it's very important that we start from a position, not that we are extending a hand to help the Palestinians, but rather that we are cleansing the blood of our own hands that soaks our own hands from the oppression of the Palestinians. And because as Zakaria has said, this is not simply a question of Israel's international legal obligations, but it is also a question of Canada's legal obligations and the legal obligations of all members of the international community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aziza, uh, for that powerful statement. Um, I hope that a lot of us living here in, in so-called Canada can reflect on that and, and, and take action. So um, before we close out, I'm going to be passing over to uh, Zafar for a minute to say a few words uh, before we conclude. Zafar. Thank you, Bianca, for those uh, wonderful concluding remarks. And I'm also going to join her in uh, thanking all of our panelists, Zakaria Ode, Dr. Yusuf al Nache, Jonathan Katab, and of course, our very own Aziza Kanji right here in Toronto for their wonderful and informative presentations, and I'm sure that our viewers have enjoyed them uh, thoroughly. I'd also like to thank all of the people that were working in the background, Karen Rodman, Michaela Levis, um, Mahmoud uh, Nakwi, uh, Imran Khan, as well as uh, Maksud, who was helping with Facebook, etc. All of these wonderful people uh, have been making sure that our webinar goes smoothly of course, we have had some technical glitches, but beyond that, things have been working okay. And of course, we found that we had uh, participants not only from here in Canada, but also the United States, Ireland, England, France, Sweden, and then all the way across uh, Africa in Nigeria, as well as uh, South Africa, and a number of uh, organizations that sponsored uh, this webinar, more than 50 
all around the world. We are very grateful for them, and we hope that you have found it informative and that you will continue to propagate the information that has been contained uh, in this webinar by our very, very distinguished panelists. So thank you for being with us. May God bless you. Thank you. So uh, as we close, I mean, it really has been an extraordinary evening. Um, such a lively discussion. I'm so sorry we didn't get to all the audience questions. There was just, there was just a lot tonight. Um, I learned a lot. Um, There's a lot of people who joined us. There were close to 200 people on Zoom. Uh, it was shared over 60 times on, on Facebook as of the beginning of this. So hopefully hundreds and hundreds uh, were watched there as well. Um, just want to extend a huge thank you to our panelists, Zachariah, Yusuf, Jonathan, Aziza. Uh, thank you for your insights, for your knowledge. Thank you to my co-moderator, Zafar. Um, again, thank you to the audience. Thank you to Karen, Michaela, Mahmoud, who've been making sure that everything works so smoothly in the background. Thank you to the journalists for coming and asking your excellent timely questions. Also want to thank all the, the sponsoring and endorsing organizations. Please find out about who they are, support their work. Um, and again, donations can be made. Uh, remember, this is a fundraiser to the Civic Coalition for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem. You can go to justpeaceadvocates.ca to donate. These funds will be provided in their entirety to the Civic Coalition for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem to support the critical legal defense work that's happening now. There's more actions to take. Sign the petition, um, the parliamentary petition, write to your MPs using our action tool. Um, you can find out more about Just Peace Advocates for, uh, at their website, foreignpolicy.ca, um, to find out more about the CFPI. I'm wishing you all an, an absolutely wonderful afternoon if you're in Canada and a wonderful evening if you're in Palestine and to all the rest of you all around the world. That's it for our program today. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Good, you. Thanks a lot. Thank Good you. afternoon. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.